a very good trick to uh, have an intriguing title and no abstract. You're all here. <laughs> so I hope to entertain you. Uh, and hopefully this, uh, uh, this will at least start you thinking. So um, my, just make sure this works. I'm not advancing here. I will do it here. No, nope, I've got a screen that doesn't advance. This is on. Thank you. And do, it will go now. Let me just check. Yeah. Good. So, um, uh, dark matter, as you all know, uh, makes up the great bulk of the universe. But the only way in which we know it's there is by its effect on things that we can see. And uh, so I'm going to ask the question about all the things we can't see <laughs> in, uh, in pragmatics. So I'm going to suggest that uh, we're probably only currently discerning a small portion of, uh, of all of the subject matter of pragmatics. And the rest, to borrow, actually, uh, Manny Shegelov's term, is dark matter. So my issue is this, you know, how do we convert things that we have no inkling about into things that we, which are known unknowns, that's to say, dark matter? And my answer will be, the only answer that I know uh, is by seeing where our current understanding sort of bumps up against the edges of our universe. So uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is sort of take you for a romp through <laughs> pragmatics. And it will be a very informal, and, uh, and, and I'm apologizing to the interpreters rather fast, uh, but um, I think uh, uh, it'll serve the purpose, I think, of sort of just making us think about all the edges of the things that we really don't know about. And of course, the reason to get to the, to the, uh, to the um, unknowns uh, is uh, as targets for future research. So I, there are a bunch of reasons for thinking there's lots of dark matter in pragmatics. Firstly, it, our theory is getting very aged. It's uh, in many cases over 50 years old. Um, and I think the old theories reflect, of course, um, old Western uh, preoccupations. A lot of them come from philosophy, um, and therefore sort of global north uh, preoccupations of various kinds. And relatedly, um, we know relatively little about the pragmatics of the vast proportion of languages. Actually, of course, in general, what we know about uh, other languages is fairly circumscribed. And here's a, from a recent paper, you can see that about a, a third uh, of the world's languages in each of the continents we know uh, don't even have a grammar of, let alone uh, extensive uh, pragmatic. And a fourth reason to suspect there's lots that we don't know is that unlike astrophysics, uh, our instruments have been relatively unsophisticated until recently, I think. Um, and now, though, we are in possession of a whole bunch of very interesting new techniques. We've got uh, machine-assisted exploitation of corpora. We've got wonderful big multimodal corpora with multiple cameras, eye tracking, kinematics, and so on and so forth. So this is obviously throwing up new data uh, and therefore new problems. Um, and then, of course, we've got newer imaging, which is still in its infancy in our field. So, um, uh, and then I think finally, we, we've got obviously underdeveloped topics. And I, I said the pragmatics of sign languages, <laughs> Christian Raman was saying it's already well developed. Uh, so, um, uh, um, but I, I suspect there's a lot more to do in uh, many fields, and we might uh, mention them in passing. So, human communication is extraordinary. You know, there's no nothing else like it on the planet uh, in its power uh, of being able to communicate thoughts of arbitrary complexity. But there is a kind of 
fly in the ointment, uh, which is a bottleneck on speech production, uh, which I think holds also for sign production, which is a, a simply a physiological maximum of the speed at which we could speak. So Lava estimates this as about eight syllables per second. Um, and it's not surprising. There are a hundred muscles involved in speaking. Uh, there's breathing coordination. There's all of the uh, mental stuff that has to happen from grammar encoding, uh, lexical retrieval, and so on and so forth. Not to mention, of course, the pragmatic computations. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a tremendous amount that has to happen. But, but still, there's this very strict bottleneck. Now, information theory, Shannon and Weaver of 1948, you know, allows us to actually measure this in terms of at least a, a, a measure the data transmission rate. It's not quite the same as information, uh, but it allows us to uh, estimate sort of uh, uh, data transmission rate. I estimated, based on the labor uh, estimate, that we have a maximum 100 bit kind of per second uh, transfer rate. Uh, a recent paper on, uh, using a cross-linguistic sample shows that there's a tendency for something like about half of that uh, as the general te tendency for speech production. So, we, so there's a, let's just take it's about 40 bits per second. Now you only have to think about your internet speed <laughs> in terms of its millions or billions of bits per second to realize this is very slow actually, right? Now, one thing that's uh, interesting uh, is that, uh, oh, I should just say, uh, semantic information, much harder to measure, of course, uh, the Bar Hillel and Carnat sort of measures, I think, are pretty much what we have. The, uh, and uh, there's a relationship between that and the information, the data uh, transmission uh, uh, speeds, because of the, they, both of these ways of thinking share this inverse rule that the more probable something is, the less informative it is. But anyway, the Bailel and Carnap idea is that a statement is informative to the extent that it rules out possible affairs. So there's some way of measuring information, but it's extremely hard actually to do in practice. But regardless of that, uh, it's easy to show that comprehension operates happily at, a, at least three times and at a stretch four times faster than production. You can show this easily by just speeding up a tape. Up to three times, you'll have no trouble understanding what's said. But four times, you start, it starts to get a little bit difficult. So I put it to you that it's this gap between our production, <laughs> uh, the slow production, and the fast comprehension that is the ecological niche that pragmatics lives in. Uh, that's where we swim. In, in that gap. So let's just sort of take for a moment a kind of engineering perspective. You know, how could we get around that bottleneck? So uh, if we were an engineer designing a language, of course we would want a better bit rate, but we're stuck with the bit rate we have. Um, uh, but, and then of course we want to in, uh, make sure our language is capable of saying informative things, so we can make sure to meet the Bar Hillel and Carnap uh, idea that uh, we can state very general things, rule out lots of states of affairs with quantifiers, negation, general vocabulary, and so on. But how do we get, how now the engineer's problem, how is he going to get around this bottleneck? What, what is he going to invent to get around that bottleneck? So, um, I'm, oh, it's obvious this is exactly what pragmatics has explored, but let's just sort of follow the engineering thought for a moment. So his first trick he's going to try, quite obviously, uh, is to, uh, uh, know, knowing that he's got uh, uh, this bottleneck problem, the first trick he's going to do, um, oh, wait a minute, sorry, I'm just letting you know that I'm just going through the strategy. So, um, so I'm going to survey half a dozen tricks that the engineer is going to use. And then for each trick, we can ask, you know, what, what uh, we, each trick is one of, one of our pragmatic fields that's already been explored, actually. And so then we're going to ask, you know, what, what is just on the borders? What don't we quite know about? And so that's the dark matter. I'm going to show it on slides like this. So every time you see one of these, we're talking about dark matter. Good. Okay, first trick, obvious, right? 
the first obvious trick is, is just uh, to get around this data transfer problem, you just multiply channels. And, uh, and of course, this is what we do. We've got the phonemes, we've got the prosody, we've got the paralanguage, we've got the gesture, we've got the gaze, we've got the face, we've got the posture, and so on. So we have all of these channels, and of course, that will uh, push up the bit rate. Um, and so there's our first trick. And the first question you might ask is, you know, how many channels are there actually? <laughs> uh, and uh, um, uh, there's a first thought. But here, let's, let's think about the dark matter here. Well, first of all, uh, there's the obvious fact that there are many channels that we know very little about. Um, so facial expressions, hugely underexplored uh, uh, in both language production, language uh, and, and the comprehension, what the auditor is doing back. Uh, we have eye contact, but Fogel and peripheral vision, it's all pretty, you know, we don't know that much about it. Uh, recently, we showed that even blinks carry uh, communicative import. Um, uh, that's to say, long blinks, which about uh, 400 milliseconds instead of 200 milliseconds. Uh, the 200 ones are just watering your um, eyeballs. And then we have a, what uh, Manny Shegloff called body talk, so posture. So um, uh, the Plenty of other channels, I think, that you can think about that are probably underexplored. But a more sort of theoretical problem uh, that Judith Holler and I pointed out is that there is a binding problem. That is the problem that the little signals on each of these channels don't necessarily synchronize. But uh, the, and, that, and by that, I mean that the bits that go together don't necessarily come together. And so it's well known, for example, that gestures precede speech by at least a quarter of a second, uh, sometimes rather more. Uh, and so this holds uh, for lots of other channels. So here you have a speaker and, uh, and there's torso movement, head posture, hand gesture, speech, mouth uh, gesture, and so on. And you've got all of these channels going on. Uh, and, and then the question is, what, which bits belong together to form? How do we unify all of this into a coherent message? I think we really have very little understanding of this. Um, then um, uh, you have to consider that in addition to what the speaker is doing, the recipient is also producing multimodal feedback. And this, of course, uh, it, it may be in some very interesting interaction with what the speakers do. We'll come back to that. Okay, so that was the first sort of in our engineer. He thought, come up with that trick. His next trick um, is to borrow a. Uh, uh, he's going to look at, um, uh, at, at you know the at cryptography, and he's going to borrow uh, tricks from cryptography. So uh, there is a branch of cryptography called steganography. Um, and what steganography is all about is about how you embed one message in another, essentially. And of course, this has been much uh, utilized in, by the spies of the past. Here's a Second World War message. You take every second letter, you end up with the <laughs> encoded message. Uh, it's uh, simple enough. Uh, Grice himself uh, cited uh, the British General Napier, who, um, uh, when uh, he was ordered to chase some brigands in northern India, ended up conquering a whole province and sent back the uh, telegram peccavi, which in Latin meant I have sinned, pun, I have the province of sin. So <laughs> it's actually apocryphal, made up by a, um, a woman, uh, um, uh, I think, uh, 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 contemporary, perhaps, so. but it's a nice story. Um, but, but the point is, I put it to you that Actually, this is what we do all the time. We have dual content, at least, because this is where, you know, the action coding, uh, we have the words and their uh, uh, informational content, and then you have this action content that almost every utterance that, uh, that people make in conversation. So, uh, so speech act, if you like, and, uh, and, um, and locutionary <laughs> uh, act. Uh, and of course, this can, It'd be multi-leveled um, uh, to take a, 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 a sort of a hackneyed kind of example. Pretty wife, you've got there, Yevgeny. Shame if she fell out of a window, and uh, and then you can uh, it, it, it suggests 
uh, a threat uh, at the same time as everything else and so on. So you can imagine that uh, many perlocutionary levels uh, can be achieved. So here's another way then the engineer can get around uh, the bottleneck problem. Uh, so here, we, um, when we think about the, the corresponding dark matter, um, where we have very little cross-linguistic uh, information about inventories of speech acts, we have no idea really whether all these action inventories look similar uh, in, uh, uh, across cultures. There's lots of reports from the anthropologists, you know, they don't have promises there or whatever, but I think it would take much more detailed work to actually get an idea uh, uh, about this and about how, uh, if, if coded, how they're coded. Um, but the kind of theoretical problem here is the whole problem of action ascription, how we ever know what action it is that's intended. Um, now, this has been explored, of course, a little bit by CA, but not as much, I think, as it should have been. It's, uh, um, there's a recent book here, Defenman and how, but uh, the, um, it really remains, I think, a kind of puzzle. And obviously there are two main kind of views here. It's incredibly fast, by the way, we did some sort of brain imaging on this, uh, and it's generally faultless. Um, you know, there are a handful of examples in, the, in my corpora anyway, of, of actual kind of misunderstandings of force. Um, so how does it work? Well, I think the two main kind of, uh, of, of, of answers here, what we're dealing with is a many to many mapping between form and function. And the question is, how on earth uh, uh, do we do this? One view is this is done by a very intensive intention recognition uh, procedure. This is sort of plan reconstruction, uh, which uh, is a, 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 even philosophically puzzling that it can be done. Um, uh, so th this is the view, and I think that sometimes it's very clear this is what's going on. So here's a, an example where somebody calls up and says, hello, I was just ringing up to ask if you were going to Bertrand's party. Uh, and then the recipient says, ah, oh, yes, I thought you might be. And uh, indicating that, uh, that the sort of fishing for an offer was already an offer of a ride to the party was already perfectly perspicuous there. Um, so there are cases where I think it's very clear uh, uh, that this, this ability to project, if you like, or, or see through or, uh, or reconstruct another's uh, intention uh, or plans are available. Another possibility which um, uh, uh, might be associated with uh, conversational analysis, with its talk of practices and so on, is the idea is just a vast association network between form, prosody, context, where context includes things like sequential context, uh, and that we've had one of those before, essentially, and we know what it is that we've got now. Um, I think there are all sorts of reasons to doubt that it's just that, uh, um, it, it, it be partly just the fact that, that the phenomenology is more deterministic. Uh, um, a second objection, I think, would be uh, that there are a lot of quite puzzly <laughs> or unusual uh, form function mappings, and I uh, put a couple up here uh, where I could eat the whole of that cake as a compliment, and oh, I'm sorry, is a disqualification of an apartment rental uh, and these things are, uh, um, you know, I, I, vanishingly rare <laughs> form uh, meaning, uh, form uh, force mappings. Anyone who sat in a CA data session, and if you haven't, I encourage you to do so, uh, will have uh, uh, met many cases where um, we are dealing with uh, 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 puzzling cases and ineffabilities. So uh, I encourage you to do that if you haven't. Right, so that, we now turn to the engineer's third trick. And his third trick is going to be to, um, to use the choice and shape of the utterance to encode uh, um, default but defeasible meanings. These are the utterance type meanings that we're very familiar with in pragmatics. Um, and uh, Grice's con uh, 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 generalized conversational implicatures um, is, uh, has been, they've been much explored. Uh, um, uh, Larry Horn, 
uh, uh, is the um, a source of a lot of thought here, uh, as he uh, outlay, outlined in his uh, first uh, talk. Um, and there, so we get the familiar implicatures. So I, I, I'm only just indexing that vast amount of work. Then there's presuppositions. Also, of course, uh, utterance type meanings uh, that something associated with the sort of form in some way and the choice of a form, uh, and then uh, also the feasible, as these examples show. Uh, and so, again, I'm just indexing a vast field of research that you're all uh, familiar with. And then, of course, you have the bridging inferences, so called by Clark, that um, uh, where uh, we have. Uh, a presupposition element in this case, in, um, the, the determiner here in the champagne, uh, which uh, you, you look for an antecedent and you link it to the picnic. So you've got all of the secondary um, uh, uh, inferences. So that'll give us a huge range of additional uh, meanings that we can slip past this bottleneck. Um, now, what is the dark matter here? Well, um, Grice himself said, uh, uh, of course, there are all sorts of other maxims, uh, and, uh, and so then uh, we wish he had uh, told, told us more about <laughs> but, uh, but he, he pointed to one, which is be polite. Uh, um, but I think the question I'm asking is, you know, how many undetect further undetected uh, rules of thumb of this sort are there that are capable of generating the kinds of inferences that the Gricean maxims do? So, be polite was one, um, uh, but uh, it, it, Claudia Strauss suggested uh, another in in the uh, um, uh, form of sort of that you expected to display cultural uh, your understanding of cultural of uh, the cultural standing of the people you're talking about. You might not even necessarily agree with their presumptions, but you should uh, uh, indicate that you know what they are. Um, uh, Here's a, here's a potential candidate, I'm just throwing these out actually for you to think about, um, uh, which is, you know, other things being equal, match the channel medium of the person uh, uh, you're talking to. And this is actually just uh, the Howard Giles' accommodation theory turned into a maxim. So social linguists know that's what people do. <laughs> so, so, but the question is, you know, it, it, it looks like, by deviating, so if I speak extra loud when you're speaking softly, you know, I, I'm going to implicate something uh, and so on. So, um, and of course, code switching would uh, f fall into this, uh, into this, uh, um, into this kind of. And then you could say here, here might be another candidate, stay within the topic or activity, other things being equal. Um, and uh, if not, you're going to have to signal that you're leaving the topic. Anyway, so how many more uh, maxims are there actually, you know, hanging out there ready to be discovered and how culture relative are they are questions I think we can ask. And then let's just go back to the presuppositions because there's been relatively very little work on on exactly um, uh, which presupposition triggers, uh, you know, translate perfectly across uh, languages. Um, I myself wrote a paper with the Yanamala years and years ago about Tamil and English, and we found uh, very similar, <laughs> uh, you know, if you found, if you tried to translate an English term into Tamil, you ended up uh, generally, but not absolutely always with the same uh, presupposition. So the question is exactly what is it that uh, triggers uh, the inferences uh, in that case? So the fourth trick that the um, uh, engineer might come up with is he might, uh, this is a bit like sort of throw, he, he, the idea is to sort of just cause some kind of reverberation, Th like throwing a pebble into a pond and, and getting the ripples. Uh, and so these are the sort of non-literal uses of language. Um, and and there have been two millennia of thought about these. I myself am not an expert here at all. Uh, there's some uh, interesting work, obviously, on, on non-serious uses of language, ironies, jokes, and so on, um, uh, where the reasons for saying something that you didn't intend seriously, of course, have to be inferred. And so that gives you that ripple effect. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, they, ha they have 
purposes uh, because they can be denied, as Trump saying to, uh, uh, when he's addressing a police academy, when you guys put someone in a paddy wagon, please do not be too nice. He didn't say rough them up, but he meant rough them up. And uh, we all know that, but his press secretary had to hurry to deny that's what he meant. Um, uh, Gunter Zenter said, this is how the Trubians, this is their default mode. <laughs> I don't know whether that's even possible, but we should talk to him. Um, so, uh, the tropes, of course, uh, analogy, metaphor, uh, and autonomy, and so on. I mean, they all have this, they share this invocation of an imprecise penumbra uh, of inferences. And uh, it's easy to think of examples uh, where, you know, you can sort of go on and on thinking, well, it could mean that, could mean that. So these tricks may discount what is said, but they trigger a great cascade of inferences that may be especially rich. Uh, and that accounts for their particular uses, of course, in poetry, uh, um, rhetoric and proverbs and so on. So that would get you round the bottleneck by giving you those additional kind of uh, um, reverberations. So the dark matter here, well, uh, I think is that partly we don't have any kind of real algorithms for cranking out <laughs> the meanings of these things. And it's not surprising because they are sort of somewhat indeterminate. Um, the, the also very interesting questions about what triggers these inferences. Uh, so teasers, for, for example, often come with a very late smile, but they're often, there's a multimodal cues, uh, but I don't think this has been a study as well as it could, it very well could be. And then you can ask what guides the direction of the inferences in each of these cases, and, and, uh, and then how do we detect uh, the intended or relevant inferences from this vast slew of inferences that are released. Relevance theory has some suggestions. Then the, uh, there are questions about how, you know, how cross-cultural are these processes? Is the inventory of tropes similar across all cultures? Uh, probably not, but what do we know about it? Um, uh, are they used for the same purposes? And then when do children acquire them? Is, is there a, a similar developmental pattern across cultures? And, and then there are questions about individual differences. Why do some people, you know, some people immediately get good jokes and others don't, and so on and so forth. So, so I think a whole bunch of interesting questions that could be followed up uh, from that, that direction. Okay, trick five, I will be my last trick or the engineer's last trick. And that and it is basically leverage the context. So uh, presuppose when you can, instead of saying, if I tell you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm late, my train broke down, uh, you now know I came by train, um, uh, but previously then I didn't have to say I came by train. Uh, and, um, uh, and in this sort of way, we can uh, smuggle extra information past. Um, in addition, again, relevance theory said quite a bit about this, you can unify the utterance with the context. Uh, and, and crank out additional inferences. So, fancy a coffee, I need to sleep. Given that, you know, coffee is a stimulant, the answer is no. Uh, and, um, and then, uh, in addition, you can exploit the a more specific activity that you're engaged in. Um, and we do this all the time in, uh, in highly structured activities. If we say, for a, in, in the beginning of a committee meeting, we seem to all be here. We have, in effect, started the, the meeting. Uh, and uh, oh, next week, we'll discuss Grice's maxim. You say that kind of thing at, towards the end of a class, you didn't intend to end it, you'll find, find that you have ended it, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So the possible maxim, mentioning the preconditions for an activity may implicate start the activity, mentioning preconditions for ending it, that's likely to end up ending it. So then, of course, we have that rolling incremental context um, and, uh, and the fact that conversational sequences exist means that if you can think you can detect the beginning of one of those things, then uh, you can sort of project uh, um, a whole lot of context. And that's what's involved when somebody uh, uh, here says, you know, what you're doing and you already detect. And that's why your answer is, uh, is vague and open, we wait to see, uh, is it an invitation uh, or a request to help uh, move the, uh, uh, 
something or other. Okay, well, uh, so we're now in the black hole of context. And, uh, and of course, the match has been written, the whole books have been written on, you know, what's really in there. Uh, and I think uh, you, you can, uh, you all, uh, there were papers actually at the conference so far uh, um, uh, about what's actually in context. Uh, but I think the interesting question is how, how much is, is it structured and how is it structured? Um, and how much of that structure is universal? We ourselves just started looking at, uh, at conversational sequences across cultures, but this is something that's hugely underexplored. Um, and, uh, and you can go on and think about topic organization, didactic parameters, all of these things with the assumptions about how the context is structured. Are these things uh, um, the same across cultures uh, or not? But maybe the sort of really big question here is how do we know what others know or believe? Because actually, uh, we sort of swim in a sea of attributed beliefs. And it's quite extraordinary that we think we know this. <laughs> of course, we may make mistakes, but uh, we think we know this. And, and the miracle then is you know, not being the party bore. Uh, not telling you things you already know, or telling the same joke twice because I've got to remember, wait a minute, I told you that joke, I can't use it with, with you again. That's an extraordinary thing, remembering, you know, what you said to whom. Uh, imagine the kind of, uh, kind of inventory you need to keep, uh, tag, tag of over time. And uh, Sachs went on to point out that, you know, in certain cases, like with bad news, you've got to actually control the order in which you uh, tell people. So I think these are uh, very, um, you know, intriguing questions that we don't know nearly enough about. And of course, without this um, uh, miracle, we wouldn't, uh, communication either be completely redundant or uh, it would misfire. I finally, I did want to mention John Garnputz's notion of a contextualization queue. It did come up in some of the talks I was hearing. I was glad to hear, because I think it's a very interesting idea. The idea basically is that by lexical choice, tone, or even language choice, you can invoke the whole apparatus, the whole um, system of inferences that are relevant here. So you actually import the context into the uh, um, into the utterance, as it were, with, it comes with the utterance. So you can think about this as a snail that uh, uh, carry an utterance carrying with it the, its own little home. <laughs> so those are, I think, some of the kind of uh, puzzles there. Good. Let me just uh, summarize where we are. Okay, good. Uh, um, um, I, so here are the tricks I've mentioned. I'm sure there are others that. Uh, the engineer might think of, and you could think about them. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I've talked about multimodality, um, the the use of dual or triple content, uh, the use of utterance type meanings, GCIs, presumption triggers, and then all of the other stuff that can be uh, projected out of that. Then you've got the tropes and non-serious language usage, and then we've got um, techniques for leveraging the context again, to get around this bottleneck. And, um, and the dark, corresponding dark matter then of the sort of neglected modalities, the binding problem across modalities, the action attribution issues, and, uh, um, and then thinking about utterance type meanings, are there you know, other possible maxims, sources of presupposition, where the hell do they come from actually? Uh, and, um, uh, and then, the, uh, in the, for tropes, this kind of uh, coordination of what you will think when I use this particular trope, the sort of coordination of inferences. Um, and, um, and then with leveraging the context, this critical question, how on earth do we know what other people know, or how do we know, at least think we know, <laughs> or know well enough. Uh, and for all of these, there's the question of the cross-cultural applicability of all of the tricks. And I think given the, uh, the conference's theme about uh, uh, human variation, um, uh, you have to relativize this uh, it, to think about you know, the diversity of modern state populations. You're dealing with lots and lots of sort of subcultures and so on. And uh, so, uh, so 
the, the question about uh, that Jürgen Jaspers, those of you who were here at the beginning of the conference, mentioned, you know, how, how do we know what the norms are uh, um, that we're going to um, utilize here? Okay, so those were the dark matter uh, issues, but now there's also dark energy. So dark energy <laughs> is, the, the, is the, the puzzle about what explains the fact that the universe is uh, accelerating and expanding when by sort of normal entropy it should be gradually slowing down. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a puzzle for the, the astrophysics. Um, and, uh, and the corresponding puzzle I suggest for us, and there may be other candidates, uh, um, is that we simply don't understand uh, the power behind the speed and effectiveness of human communication. So um, the, my colleagues in the Nijmegen Institute for Psycholinguistics I've done a lot of work on speech production and the inbuilt latencies into in it. This is the the the, the we're back to this bottleneck issue, uh, and they know they can tell you about what's happening millisecond by millisecond in the in the brain, as it were, um, and the way the signal has to sort of go from concept to phonetic encoding and all of the stages that are involved. A lot of the time involved is actually phonological encoding. Um, okay, but now we take this. They, what they found is that to produce a single word takes you at least 600 milliseconds. Um, to produce a word that is sort of not, uh, is not been primed, is not, uh, is not been mentioned uh, earlier, it's going to take you more like a second. To produce a short sentence is going to take you about 1200 milliseconds. These are the kind of numbers that come out of the psycholinguistics. Now, uh, you plug this back into our conversational turn-taking. Right here you have Anne talking, uh, and, uh, and Bill is going to respond, but uh, he's going to respond at a 200 millisecond interval, roughly. Uh, they, uh, this is a distribution of turn, turns in a typical conversation. There's a bit of uh, leeway here, but you know, uh, on average we're talking about two to 300 milliseconds, people are responding. Um, and there's slight differences, of course, across uh, <laughs> individuals and across cultures, uh, but, but it's all ballpark similar. So uh, now we plug back that 600 milliseconds back into this uh, um, uh, turn-taking system. And what we see uh, is that in order for Bill here to respond to Anne and come in on time, he has got to guess what the second half of, uh, or at least the latter parts of what Anne is going to say are going to be. He's gonna to have to project it uh, as the conversational analysts say. Um, and a lot of the pragmatic inferences that we're interested in have to be done very early because we want to, the, the thing we need to compute is first of all, what was it? A question, ah. So now I need to answer. I've got a retrieval of the bits for the answer. Um, and, uh, and all of that computation, scalar inferences, whatever, it's got to be retrieved very early. It's got to happen fast um, uh, uh, in, in order to keep within that, uh, uh, that tight time scale. That's the dark energy I put to you. you know, we don't really have a clue how this is possible. Um, and, uh, you know, how can we reason that fast? Uh, uh, and, and now I point, and this is perhaps, you know, grasping at straws, but, you know, one possibility, I think, is that we had the psycholinguists have got a little bit wrong. They tend to think about speech production as sort of ballistic. We shoot this missile, and sure, there's a, a, a self-destruct button, you know, so you can, you can, you can uh, stop it, uh, but you can't do much more <laughs> once you've, you know, concocted it, uh, then uh, you shoot it. Um, and, uh, and, and there, there are clues, uh, have been clues for a long time, this can't be quite right. Uh, Chuck Goodwin years ago pointed out that, uh, that people are up to some point able to retool an utterance, for example, to fit a, um, a new addressee. Um, and then we have all of this multimodal feedback going on. 
uh, Japanese aizuki are, have been perhaps the best studied uh, uh, thing here. The, uh, it, so there's a lot of stuff going back, supposing this could really be utilized by the speaker. And so that midway, there's some kind of negotiation going on, uh, which allows recalibration of meaning and intent uh, and retooling of an utterance midstream. We simply don't know whether this is possible, but it, if, if so, it may help to explain, I think, the speed uh, that um, is so pu otherwise puzzling. Right. Well, I think there are many other targets for future research, and I'll slip through this quickly because many of these things have been, I'm delighted to see, being addressed in the uh, various panels at this conference. Um, you know, the issues about how we modulate utterances to indicate all of the different kinds of social relationships that we have. Um, and, and, uh, and the theme, the conference theme that Jorgen Jasper has outlined at the beginning um, is uh, it, it's, it's worth just thinking about individual variation. Uh, on the one end, we have what we uh, many people are studying, the pragmatic def deficits um, that have been uh, mentioned. I, you could just say this is part of the uh, uh, population diversity uh, that we're dealing with. Um, and it's only become sort of medicalized uh, uh, because of uh, uh, our particular tradition of Western medicine. Um, one of the things, though, here very clearly is that we have a lack of sort of proper benchmarks for, if you like, normal <laughs> uh, communication that may uh, make the, the, this is, this is all, almost totally in the hands of medics. Uh, and, um, and you can't expect them to be terribly good at pragmatic, uh, kind of the detection of pragmatic anomalies. So, but at the other end of uh, individual variation, we've got interactional grace, people who are just have that gift of being able to ease things along socially. Uh, and then we have uh, the rhetorical prowess that seems to lie a lot behind um, our political systems, uh, for good or ill. <laughs> um, so that's another sort of whole area that I think could be studied. We have the pragmatics of child language, which is still, it, it, it comes and goes in waves. It's a lot of ways in the 70s. It's coming back now, but there's a lot more to do. Pragmatics of sign, I, I'm sure there's a lot more to, uh, to do here, uh, despite what Christian said. Uh, and the pragmatics applied to animal communication and the evolution of human communication. And, um, and then we have the interactional limits of AI, which are being discussed very extensively at this conference. Uh, but um, one thing I just wanted to raise is that there's just one other system on the planet that uh, has anything like the coding potential that uh, natural language has, and that's DNA. And DNA has its own pragmatics. It's called epigenetics uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in that field, but it's the way, it's, it's a way in which the, uh, the message can be amplified, modulated, and so on, the coded message. So we're dealing also here with the possibility, which goes back to early thinkers in pragmatics. Is there a possibility of a kind of general pragmatics or semiotic systems uh, uh, that, would that would transcend uh, language uh, genetics and so on and so forth and so on. I'm sure there are many other subjects, but finally, I just want to, to emphasize that, you know, for humans, we have one elite capacity. We don't swim well, we don't fly, but we do have this extraordinary ability to communicate. And uh, I have argued, and I think probably most people in this room uh, would agree, that it rely, relies entirely on a pragmatic base, what I've called the interaction engine, but uh, other people have got other terms. And, and that this is the key to language origins, language acquisition. So I, I, what I wanted to just end on was the uh, point that we, I think we really are custodians of fundamental knowledge about this pragmatic base and so about sort of wellsprings of human social relationships and culture and we have a, a i think a, a yeah many other disciplines i think need our input and i think we have a kind of responsibility uh, to try to bring these insights into these other fields um, i mean I, i've had some dealings with behavioral geneticists and I, I, they 
desperately need <laughs> to know what we know. Um, so that's our duty, I think. Uh, and I, as I said, I think there's still much too much enthrall to uh, dated theory. And I'm looking forward to a renaissance of theoretical work, which will come from you. So over to you. 